So this is actually going to be recorded. Um, I host a podcast called The Mobilecast. And so we'll record this, and uh, we'll put the link up. It'll also be on the uh, Engage website for M6. And we've actually done this the last three of these. So, and it's usually a different group of people, so it's going to kind of be fun. And uh, we're going to have our intro, which will, for at least from that table, provoke laughter. But <laughs> it's the way we grow. So are you guys recorded back there? I see, I see a plus sign, so. Um, Hey, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the MobileCast. We are coming to you live from the M6 Mobility Exchange. We are in Scottsdale, Arizona at the Hyatt Regency. And I am lucky enough to be joined by four friends of mine, uh, some analysts, some other people. I'm actually going to ask them to introduce themselves starting. You get one minute, because then we're going to get it, dive right into content. But why don't we start with you, Sanjay? So um, I'm Sanjay Khanna. I'm the senior analyst for enterprise mobility at IDC uh, Canada. And uh, my focus is really trying to understand uh, mobility in the context of everything from the uh, local, uh, you know, the Canadian marketplace, but also from the lens of global megatrends. Um, I've been an academic futurist and really trying to understand the mobile moment, the IoT moment, the cloud moment, what's going on here, why are we needing to innovate this fast against what external conditions. So that's, um, hopefully we'll get into some of that longer range thinking uh, as part of the podcast. How can you be an academic futurist? You can work with an academic institution in a futurist role. Oh, okay. I was, I was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so Kevin actually wants to introduce himself now. <laughs> so I'm Kevin Benedict, uh, former... Are you today or in the future? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I'm Kevin Benedict, senior analyst uh, for the Center for the Future Work at Cognizant former cow milker and uh, analyst. Adam? Uh, Adam Stein, APS Marketing. It's a product marketing uh, firm I started about a year ago. Uh, recovering a uh, marketing guy at uh, various security, mobile, and networking startups, and a couple larger companies, too. Uh, Ken Daniels. I'm a founding principal of a small boutique consulting firm called Acomments Advisors. We help folks like you uh, get to know each other. We do biz dev for uh, enterprise mobility companies. So we're going to be talking about insights for the future. And yeah, I'm going to start out. And we couldn't get this up on the screen, so I'm hoping you can all see this. They, they haven't seen this yet. But the question is, is this the future? I'm going to let them see it first. <laughs> if you, hopefully, you can see this. I don't know if they can throw this up on the big screen. But you see somebody wearing a VR headset that says Tinder. And in the middle of a subway station, he is swiping left and right in midair. <laughs> Is this, you know, it, but in reality, I, I want to ask the question a little bit differently. I, you know, I have kids. My kids are, um, I have a college age uh, daughter and a high school daughter. And, you know, we went and we saw Wally a few years ago. And we talk about VR, and that's what scares the crap out of me. I look at, I see people just sitting on couches, watching Netflix, watching everything else, never getting up. Is this how we experience the world? Is this where we're heading? I think it's aided. I think augmented reality as opposed to virtual reality is what we talked about on a tweet chat not too long ago. And I think it, there's a difference there. It's to be able to combine what you're working on in a, in a virtual space but not be totally virtual, that makes a difference. Well, I think, I think the question is actually is that where the kids are headed, not necessarily where, where are we headed. I, I, well, are, are I, we... I think that for business, I yeah. fully agree yeah. AR, is, AR is where, the, where, it needs to where be. it's going. But for the world, where are we going? Future, man. Come on, these, Ken. These are the future guys. No, I, I look at my kids, and my kids, I'm lucky where my kids actually all play sports. And so they actually, they actually do things. Um, my, my high school junior just got invited to be part of the National Honor Society. And when, when all of us were growing up, the National Honor Society was all about, if you got the grades, you're in. And now, the kid who's ranked number one in his class did not get into National Honor Society because the kid, all he does is sit at home, play video games, and study. And so that's, I'm afraid that, yes, you're right, that we're going to get to the point where maybe not our kids, but our grandkids are going to be swiping left, are right, be in left, and, swiping left and right in the subway <laughs> and just sitting there. Kevin. Yeah, I would think that that's probably not going to be the long-term future because I think all of us are going to want the technology that's surrounding us to actually disappear. 
because once it starts becoming intelligent, it should disappear. You shouldn't have a table full of gadgets. The capabilities of all those gadgets should just be in the air. It should be there in your wall. It should be there when you walk up to it. You shouldn't have to be dealing with all this. It actually, I think, will actually, um, once we become uh, the novelty of all the goodies and the gadgets, when that wears off, yeah. I think we're all going to see the intelligence embedded in everything, but the technology starts disappearing so, behind so the scenes. Are we going to the Star Trek holodeck, or you know, what are we looking at here? Well, I mean, there's another way to think about it, and that is that um, uh, VR technologies, if you're looking at it from a, a home, uh, neighborhood, social perspective, they're just the new neighbor. And they're now you know, in your neighborhood, and they're going to be part of the community until they either you know, move out or they have kids and they start you know, populating the neighborhood. And I think it's, um, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out, because a lot of what's driving um, VR and AR is a sense of disconnection people are feeling. They need to feel something that's very tangible, very real, very three-dimensional in ways they might not be experiencing people uh, and places uh, in the course of their daily lives. So, you know, you're forced, you're forced uh, in a very immersive live experience when you're using uh, VR and AR technology uh, in ways that um, I think uh, give us what we want in terms of that sense of being very present. So, you know, there are two ways of looking at it. How do we become more present so we use these technologies more appropriately? And, and how does the workplace enable that? How does, you know, design thinking and architecture, you know, all these innovation labs and workspaces and all these kinds of things, they're trying to do that. They're trying to make you feel more present, more connected in real space. So I think there's going to be a tension between those. Well, it, you know, but then do we, does that presence become, you know, I, I car, do my daughter's carpool to soccer. I'll have three kids sitting in the back. They won't say a word and they're having a text conversation back and forth. With each other. And, you know, and they <laughs> never talk. The only person that they will, an, either of my daughters will answer the phone for is my wife or myself. And that's because we told them, if you, never, if you don't answer the phone, you lose your phone. But they don't, people don't call. People, you know, it's, we have to text. So they're present. You hear laughter, they'll exchange looks, but I worry that that presence is still an artificial presence. And I think it's a partial presence, it's a diffuse yeah. presence where you're, you know, you're being trained in some ways in school to multitask, and in business sometimes you multitask, and there's a, a risk in multitask too much. Uh, there's definitely a, a fine line that I think you don't want to cross, that you do want to be able to be present in what you're working on, the application, whatever, you know, is in front of you as opposed to all the different things that are, you know, all around the sides of you. So uh, there's a woman named Linda Stone who um, was the VR researcher um, at Microsoft Research in the mid-90s. So they were looking at 3D chat rooms and this sort of thing. And she coined a term that's been used by a lot of organizations to try to understand what's happening to the um, attention of their people, and it's called uh, the term she used is continuous partial attention. So it's, it's worth looking up um, her work and how that's been used by different organizations to understand the working modalities. Uh, develop, it's it, it impacted the evel, uh, development of UX and UI. So there was a really neat team uh, working out of uh, Nokia some years ago uh, using her concepts. And what they developed was really in the background ways to scan what was happening with your digital environment. So there was a big screen in the room where you might be working. So instead of having to look at your computer, if birds were flying around, uh, uh, a lot of birds were flying around in that, in that environment uh, on the screen, you knew you had a lot of emails to respond to. And if it was kind of quiet, there might be a single bird sort of flying in the air on the back of the screen. And that was all turned out, you know, uh, channeled from the email program. So I mean, there's some really interesting ways to look. So how do you, how do you make it ambient? You know, these sorts of things that we feel demand our attention. How can we create a kind of ambience to create a kind of calm around how we accomplish our tasks? In the age of Slack, yeah, where yeah. now you have all these notifications coming at you from everywhere and it you know, looks like uh, Hitchcock's The Birds. But. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a different thing to suggest there. Um, if you take the technology out of the argument and just take people, because we are all people, which some of us are. Yeah. I've seen your robot. Um, <laughs> 
you look at mindfulness training. Does anybody raise your hand if you've ever heard of mindfulness training? Anybody? Yeah. I think, I think it's a really good program. SAP chartered it when I was there as far as having somebody in-house as a full-time instructor. And I was lucky enough to go through the trial course. I think they think I needed mindfulness training. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> My eyes are blinking too fast. Exactly. Wait, so the whole mindfulness training thing was a great course. And if you haven't heard of it, you know, take a look for it online. Because rather than just focusing on the technology element, there's nothing wrong with that, Sanjay. I think right. it's the human element of getting people to be able to focus on a conversation that they're having or something, a task at hand. And yes, you're always gonna have multiple things you know, clamoring for your attention, but the mindfulness training aspect of things helps you really get singular and focus on something and then move on to the next thing, knowing that you have other things to do, but really focus. Which yeah. is why Google's been one of the sponsors of Wisdom 2.0. Uh, it's an annual event in, in the Valley that covers uh, uh, mindfulness training. Yeah. Kevin, you want to? Answer? So the goats in Rwanda, they look both left and right <laughs> when they're crossing a road. They look down too. The road has holes, puddles. Why do they do that? It's because that's the environment they grew up in. And they're looking for cars and that's how they survive. If they don't do that, they die, right? We should not, as five grumpy gray-haired men up here, <laughs> get on, a, uh, you know, like uh, be negative about the technology that we in fact brought to the market. Right. I mean, we're the ones that we should blame for this no. technology, right? Absolutely. So our kids are learning to adapt to the environment we handed them. And the fact that they're adapting very well to that environment should be something we should celebrate and say those kids are going to thrive in this new world of digital. So let's now take this to business. What's this mean? It, you know, you've heard, and you know, there's a comment to the table. Can we please stop talking about millennials? <laughs> and you know, he, I think everybody up here knows Ray Wang, and he talks about the five stages of um, digital, you know, digital natives versus um, luddites and the like. What does all the, what do all these devices? What do all these experiences? We mentioned AR, VR. Um, we're going to get into AI in a minute. What's this mean to the future of business and how we work? And you know, you have people here who are from the business and IT, and how those pe how you get to support those people? Well, I think there's there's two parts and pieces to it, though. When you when you think about that part, there's what are we doing today, and what's what are we going to be doing in the future? Because you know, half the people who are here, and, and I'm going to make a generalization, half the people here are either still very early in their digital transformation, even going mobile, and they're they're fighting internally about. You know, we've got all these technologies that are out there. We've got all these things we should be implementing today. How do we get the business and the IT to agree on what we're going to do? And then we've got to do it. But to get there, you've got to have a strategy. And you have to have a strategy that goes out the next five years. Well, think back five years ago. What did we have for technology? You know, iPhone came out, what, eight years ago? Yeah. Yes. That's not, that, that's, not that, that's not that long ago. No. Yeah. So five years from now, what technology is going to be there? You can't strategize for technology five years from now. All you can strategize is what, what do we think we want to be as a business? Where do we think we want to be? What do we need to be able to support? Because you're not going to be able to say, I'm going to roll this out, and these are the steps I'm going to take over the next three to five years. I'm going to roll this out this year, then this out next year, and then this out the following year. Because well, one to three year horizon looks more realistic. Well, right? yeah, but if you've, <laughs> you, you, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe. You, know, you, you still don't know, you know what's, what's IoT going to bring? What's AR going to bring? What's AI going to bring? What are all these things going to bring to the table? And how do we, how do we plan for that? You, know, you made a comment, I think it was yesterday, that we've been doing these events now for four, five, six years, whatever the number is, and we're still having some of the same conversations about, you know, okay, everybody's gotten beyond email and PIM, but... They haven't. <laughs> they haven't. And, you know... Most people. Most people some have... People. Some people have gotten beyond email and PIM, but there's still, you know, if we, if we ask for show of hands here, there's still a bunch of people who are still trying to figure out some strategic stuff, and they're still confused. So we're already, you know, from, as, as technology guys, we're already... 10 years in the future, and we're still waiting for, for this group to catch up. And, you know, it's interesting, because I can just see people on their VR, AR headset scrolling through their mail. Yeah. Everywhere. And, you know, what's funny is, yeah, I th Chris Prey may be in the room right now from Nacho Cove. He's written a couple of articles. You know, it, it is an email client with some really, you know, take a look at it. It's very cool. But, 
He talks about the fact that he talks that Slack is getting rid of email. And it's not. And everywhere I look, people, Slack has become another channel. Just like links become another channel. Yep. Yep. And you see it all over the place. You know, it was Yammer at one point. We'll, we'll see something else. How does that fit into, you know, getting beyond just notifications and responding to requests? You have to prioritize yeah. what channels that you're going to pay attention to based upon the job you're doing, the time of day it is, where you are. There's a lot of variables, human variables, that are going to help you determine where you're going to prioritize your, your channel uh, visibility, what channels you're going to look at. But this is where cognitive has a big, you know, there's a big potential in terms of uh, auto calendaring and um, uh, having uh, background data analysis that schedules your appointments when you work, uh, when you work most effectively, um, that, that uh, might even schedule your email time and workout times. Google's trying to figure out some of these things to you know, pre-plan uh, when you do certain regular activities. And again, if it, it means working out or picking up your kids or something in order to mm -hmm. auto-populate um, some of your regular activities according to when you do the more effective, most effectively or, or when they need to get done. So I mean, I think, I think you know, lining up the, uh, thinking about the team dynamics and what you want in terms of understanding how an effective team works. Um, a lot of it is around the diversity of the team. A lot of it is around having more women on the team. A lot of it is about having uh, empathic uh, uh, work styles where people want to hear each other's ideas and make sure that different perspectives aren't left out to have an effective integrated working team. So maybe part of this is participatory design and working with the teams to think about which tools and technologies are helping them uh, achieve uh, uh, their milestones and be successful at what they do. I think there's going to need to be more uh, participatory work with uh, the actual um, uh, high-performing teams in order to extend what they're learning to the rest of the organization. Kevin? I see this gap out there because we all recognize that email is a pain in the butt and is a very inefficient way of managing communications, yet it seems like nobody's going to budget to fix it. System of record. Yeah, yep. so it's so it's um, it's a huge, but it's a huge problem that um, reflects the challenge that most companies are still being run by people almost our father's age, up here, and our parents' age, and there's a generational gap between that is very difficult to overcome in understanding the capabilities of digital transformation. And so the guys that write the check and the ladies that write the check today are often not, uh, don't appreciate the same things that um, millennials will, or us that are in technology. Sorry, I said millennials. Yeah, but are they, open, are they open, Kevin, to learning more about what digital transformation can mean to them? Are they being educated, are they interested in being but, educated so, on learning that? But, but I, I, have data, I have data on that we just got last week. We surveyed, um, mid-level managers and executives and MBA students and futurists. So we had four different categories. By far the most negative toward digital transformation were the C-level folks. Yeah, but you know, what you bring up there is if you don't make digital transformation mean something to the people, they don't buy in. And no, it, you know, it has it's to be relevant to them. You, know, this is, this, you have to say this is why it's important to you. This is, this is, this, that you're going to get this ROI for doing this. You know, we talk shadow IT all the time. The term comes up, I hate it. And I always refer to it as shadow innovation. Because 99% <laughs> of the people who are doing things that maybe IT doesn't like, the business doesn't like, they're doing it to get their job done. They're not doing it to be malicious. They're not doing it to steal data. They're saying, my job is easier if I use this app and it allows me to spend more time talking to a customer, more time working on something else. Yeah. And when people actually seek out those people who are doing this and say, how are you doing it and why are you doing it? And bring that back in. Now the transformation starts to take hold because you're taking what people want to do and giving them the time back to get stuff they've done. And I, I would challenge you to say that if you don't make it meaningful to them, change for change's sake doesn't help them get anywhere. I'll give you a good example, Brian, because I, I think you were looking for examples, right? At our previous company, we had a challenge from a marketing standpoint and sales standpoint of getting our channel partners involved in our business. Well, we wanted to make sure they understood what was happening on the sales side, 
on the marketing operations, on the automation side. We created, for that company, the second mobile application they'd ever built using force.com. And this application became the de facto for 300 partners globally to keep up with everything that was happening at that company from a sales standpoint, a marketing standpoint, a training standpoint. It was a hub. And it was a great application. And the sales team at first was a little bit skeptical to be blunt about it. They're like, no, they counted us for that information. It's like, well, they're not getting it. Right. You know, they're not, they're not increasing their sales. They're not, I measure things. They're not being productive partners, right? They're not generating five or more deals per month. So how do you make them more productive? Well, they want more information. They've told us that. Well, how do you do that? You create an application. Well, are they going to use it? If they want their sales information right. and they want their marketing information, they want the content, yeah, they're going to use it. And they do. And they still do. So let's move a little bit into AI. Um, and I think uh, everybody, at least three of you, and I, I think, Sandra, you've been on it once. Um, I also run a tweet chat every Thursday at 1 o'clock. There are a lot of participants in the room. And we talked about AI last week. Google I.O. Um, announced their Allo Assistant and our uh, Allo Chat client and their Google Assistant, which they haven't named. <laughs> and a number of people said, I would love Google Assistant for work. And you know, there are a couple out there, there's Clara and a few others of, I want something that can schedule my time. You talked about that, you all talked about it. Two questions come from this. A, do we think Google is, go or is it Google or is it someone else who's going to take the lead in that business AI piece? And number two, with privacy and everything else, do we actually, do you, we actually think it'll be the same Google Assistant or will it be Google Assistant for work or Microsoft Cortana for work? versus, you know, how do you keep your private life and your, you know, your business separate? Because your business doesn't want that data to leak out either. And where do we see that going in leaps and bounds? And is it soon? Is it three, four years Where's off? Where's the edge of dual persona? Right. The ragged edge of dual persona? It's a good question. I'm making them think now. Yeah, well, no, it's 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 um, smoke, right? It's, <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be very interesting because the organizations that are um, heavily, you know, are are being driven by security constraints, are going to look at things like that. They might have internal virtual assistants uh, with cognitive components that that stay uh, within their within their firewalls, and they build, you know, they use Watson or they use other kinds of tools that they can. Um, uh, keep uh, you know inside a private cloud or in, in some uh, sort of other way protect protect that that data and information. I mean, there's another piece that you know we haven't really addressed when we think about um, uh, you know the the future of all these technologies. And one is the the constant psychological stress that people inside organizations are, are facing. And I spoke to um, Billy Howes from uh, American Airlines, uh, and they found that once they started providing uh, some of their workers with uh, a, a lot of uh, digital tools that, that were very efficient for them. The cognitive load of being, having to respond to even more quickly yeah. because they'd, they'd, they'd made the process so efficient was creating stress for the workers and making them make mistakes, which is why they moved to sort of a four-day week because the amount that people could get, get done and how productive they could be uh, over four days was enough uh, as a result of the efficiencies they'd driven that were also causing a great deal of cognitive stress. And there's much more stress across the American uh, and Canadian workforces now with precarious employment, uh, the, the use of lots and lots of digital tools that you need to learn uh, to use well. So, you know, part of uh, the future of technology is how we're going to reduce the cognitive load and stress on workers, executives, and different folks who we don't want to make uh, mistakes as they work faster. And it's do you ever turn off? That you know, it, it's a my kids were very good years ago saying no phones at the table. And, you know, they said that to you, but now you have to say that to them. No, they, they've carried <laughs> through the rule very good. As long as all four of us are at the table, yes. If it's not all four of us, it's a different story. But yeah, again, you guys, you want? Um, it's, it's a big challenge, but I'm going to go back and say that's why technology has to disappear behind the scenes. And the artificial intelligence should not, in fact, create more stress, but remove a lot of stuff from you. If you look at the, uh, in the US Air Force, we have the new F-35s. It's incapable of being flown by a pilot because it requires so much more than a human 
can do on their own to fly it and keep it in the air. So they have built all this AI into the system to keep it afloat so that the pilots can narrow their focus to just what's important, which is mission, completing the mission successfully without all the other issues resolved, I mean, that are there because of the capabilities of the fighter but, pilot. But everything in our life has to mature to that part. So technology disappears and the things that we need from technology are happening automatically because it knows us, it knows where we're going, it knows context. And so things, you know, our doors are opening when we're walking toward them. Our, um, our security system comes on when we head out for work. Our car warms up when, the t when we're walking out the door, or turns on when we're walking out the door, starts warming up because it knows us and we can stop thinking about those kinds of things. I, I buy into that vision, but you know, I love the example you use because yeah, the F-35 is so complex that we're wondering whether it's ever actually going to fly. They have to reboot the radar in the air because the, they can't figure out what the problem is. Mm -hmm. So they have a radar glitch in the fighter that you're flying a plane, you need the radar and you actually have to reboot it in the air. You know, think about that. It's one thing on your iPad, your Windows, whatever, you get blue screen of death, you hit the power button. Yep. Um, you're flying a plane and we have airlines in here, we know the redundant systems and do we actually become too dependent? And imagine this in work. You know, it's not hard to, you know, think back to the Tacoma Bridge that we all saw as kids, the black and white, the bridge that starts yep. resonating to the point where it actually breaks. Yeah. If we give too much to the AI and we forget about the people who are involved in the system. Skynet, man. Do we run into that problem? <laughs> it's Skynet. That's well, is it Skynet problem. or is it just, they don't even know, we don't, it's not that it was intentional, just something there are consequences that we can't see because we didn't do the boundaries right. Oh, yeah, yeah the, the professor, the French professor, uh, Paul Virilio says that all progress comes inherently with um, not accidents, but a automatic con negative consequences. So you can't experience progress. You can't create an airline industry with airlines without automatically creating airline disasters. So it's not an accident and it's not, you know, something went wrong. No, it's automatic. You create a driver, uh, uh, autonomous driverless car, there's automatically going to be problems that are going to cost, cost lives. Yeah, but it, it, it basically, it, it helps create progress too. Right. Mm -hmm. So your point is, okay, it's two steps forward, one step back. So yeah. you have that in life and you've seen that in business all the time. In startups, I mean, for every... Every one startup that succeeds, I think 10 or 20 or fail. Or something like that. You know, tons of them fail. Were they total failures? Did you learn from them? Absolutely. I learned a ton. They were not total failures. So, yeah, I mean, you, you learn by that. That's the human brain. Yeah, just don't use your money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it's interesting that um, uh, all of us uh, probably have examples from a military technology where uh, tech is being used to uh, you know, a very advanced uh, degree in incorporating all kinds of human computer interaction research and, and all kinds of things like that. But, you know, the amount of budget that those organizations have to think through those things is really great, but it's also very alpha male oriented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the kinds of diversity we want in organizations, the kind of um, insights we want, uh, the kind of humanism we want to get uh, work done in effective ways, uh, you know, that what we're seeing in mobility uh, really is, you know, that's why we're seeing this combination of design thinking, uh, ethnographers, uh, all these uh, social scientists, new kinds of inputs into the uh, business and IT, uh, the, the, the usual business IT relationship. So I think, you know, the organizations in terms of adapting to this future of the technology coming at them are going to be the ones that figure out how to best use their uh, human intelligence and human factors uh, in order to uh, create a better collaborative team environments across these technology types. And I think you can't really do that unless you're involving the users deeply, even in the uh, selection uh, of some of the technologies, uh, uh, probably more than, than, than we're doing uh, right now where uh, workers tend to just get the technology that they're getting. I think the military example that Brian brought up is a really good one because Look at what military uh, has brought to uh, the enterprise, especially around cryptology and, and uh, encryption. 
right? A lot of the modern encryption and cryptology stuff that's done in enterprises originated in government technology. And there's a reason for that. There was a need for that. It was a use case. Did it always work, to Kevin's point? Nope. No. But the things that did work, especially in different governments, like the Israeli government, for example, or you know, even the US government, those things have been brought into commercialization and been shown to have been successful to bring out the enterprise. And I think that'll continue to happen across different sectors of the market in the future. Ken, you want to come That's up? That's a great point. Keep going. So I'll just add, in the context of military, one of the interesting things is that when you put a bunch of 18 and 19-year-olds in the battlefield with smartphones, they start doing a lot of things on their own. Mm -hmm. right. They can pull up Google Earth and they can look at you know, satellites that uh, imagery that's more accurate than they were getting from their official sources and so there had to be all kinds of regulations around that. But the, uh, in the Marines they have approved all kinds of Android devices now with their own kind of security on it that give them access to more of these kinds of capabilities that the market has. But what it has forced the military leaders to do is change their doctrine and I would strongly encourage that no company is going to be successful long-term in digital transformation without having a digital transformation doctrine that says what exactly are we trying to accomplish with all these little innovations? You know, where are we going with this? You know, we, we don't want to be ad hoc. We don't want to be uh, rudderless in this effort toward digital transformation. So what is that? Is that four points or five points we're trying to accomplish? Is that we need to have a real-time enterprise that can, uh, w that we can do real-time collaboration, that we have different kinds of customer engagements and interactions mm -hmm. in the environment our customers most prefer? You know, what are those four or five points that we're, gonna, uh, we're going to say, this is our digital transformation doctrine, this is our guideline. Now, everything underneath that, we're going to build to that doctrine. Okay. Well, yeah, that goes back. Modern-day Declaration of Independence, if you yeah. will. Well, I mean, that goes, back, <laughs> that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, about having, you have to have a strategy, even though you have no idea how you're going to get there. You've got to have this idea of where you want to go. And you know, I think all of us have grown up. We said, OK, if we're going to go from point A to point B. Speak for yourself. Well, I'm not really grown up yet, but yeah, I thought 12-year-old, 12-year-old twelve year, year old boy. Um, but no, so I, I saw something one time that said, you know, these are things that kids will never see, and one of them was an atlas. And so, you know, right now we've got to get the people who are who are running our companies, who are let's call them older than us, to understand that you know, when I leave the house today, if I'm in the car mm -hmm. and I'm leaving the house and I'm going someplace I know, I've never been before, it doesn't bother me because I know I'll just throw on the GPS and I'll, get the, and I'll know. GPS, I'm gonna, Google Street View. Google, all, yeah, all this other stuff. And you know what, if I use, depending on what I'm using, not only will it take me where I'm going, but it'll take me there the fastest way, even if I have to drive through somebody's backyard. <laughs> and you know, I, I went someplace a couple days ago and I thought I actually did. But you know, <laughs> we used to have an atlas. So you get up, you know, think back to you know, 20 years ago, you had an atlas. And you said, okay, I'm going from point A to point B. These are the streets I need Where you to went take. to AAA, you got the trip you tick. Went to, you got the trip tick from oh, really? AAA. Then, AAA, AAA is the ways of the old days. But then, you know, in 10 years ago, Analog ways. you would go and you'd print out your list of directions. Yep. And you're like, wow, this is great. And then nowadays, it's, like I said, it's real time. It's hard to get folks, you know, my parents still won't use Google Maps to get anywhere they're going. To get them to use GPS, nope, nope, nope. not going to happen. So to, to have that, it's almost a suspension of need to know everything that's going on. Yeah, for a corporation, that's really hard. Again, to say, we, here's our doctrine, this is what we want to do, this is our five-year plan. We don't know how we're going to get there yet. That's kind of where we have to be, and but then, I don't yeah, think it's We're going to go the lightning round in a second, because we're going to run out of time. I was, where I was going to take from that is, we all read about GPS accents where the GPS said drive off a bridge because it didn't know that the bridge was being repaired, right. or somebody drives into a lake, drowns, whatever else, and it's, what it points out is that with all this technology and all this transformation, we still need somebody at the wheel who every now and then looks up and pays <laughs> yep. attention where you're going. But let's actually jump into the lightning round, and then I'm going to take one or two questions, and Phil hopefully won't kill me. We'll try, we'll try and keep you on He's time. behind you with a hook, but it's okay. Um, one thing that you, one device or one thing that you want to get or you expect to have in the next two years that you don't have now? Do. Kevin, just go down the line. Um, so I don't have something in mind. 
Okay, Adam. Adam. Uh, for the house, uh, a, a, um, an entertainment hub that has all the different types of entertainment channels uh, that I want, uh, both on demand and things I have, content I own already, that can be shared seamlessly throughout the house or anywhere I am connected. Kevin, do you come up with something? Yeah, well, home automation system. I read about it and I write about it constantly, but I haven't done it. And uh, I'd love to have a security system because I travel so much. Yeah. Where you can actually have visibility into what's going on at your house and around your house. Yep. Yeah, I, th I think that's yeah. probably that's probably the the one that I would say too. Is you know, we all know what, where the technology. We're in a different place than most people, where we know where the technology is going. We know what's there. I just haven't implemented it at my house yet. Sanjay, um, I think a really great digital sound system. Digital um, sound. Sound. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, you know the inter the interaction between entertainment systems, uh, where there's really really we're we're used to degraded sound in our environments. When we use our our headsets for work, um, when we use uh, our our mobile devices, we're used to to degraded sound, and so rebalancing that with really uh, great uh, digital technologies that improve and enhance yeah. our ability to listen is going to be important. Taking well, out that turntable, putting a piece yeah. of vinyl on. Yeah. But, but, uh, I've been kicking and screaming away from my vinyl. But, but more Actually, George and I were talking about that yesterday. More seriously. The big I was, vinyl CD player. I was, <laughs> I was um, the futurist in residence of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. And we did some work on uh, looking at long-term stresses and what they do to people's ability to listen. And uh, oh, under uh, long-term cognitive oh, stress, <laughs> people don't listen as well to each other. If you want to have a high-performing organization... What did you say, Ken? What, what did you say? <laughs> if you want to have a high-performing organization, Clapping. you're going to have to have an environment where people can listen better we'll to signals right of change inside and outside the organization in order to adapt to that. And that's what we want our technologies to do, to help us adapt to the environment, adapt to the risks, and perform uh, more effectively. Phil, I'm hoping you're going to let me take a question. Do we have any questions out here? Does, does, does the peanut gallery over here or anybody in here want to ask a question of these guys? Okay, we got, we got future time future. for one question. Oh, man. Is that uh -oh. Uh -oh. Mr. Belding. <laughs> this is a 10-part question. <laughs> uh, no, so, uh, so Brian asked a little bit earlier about um, Cortana and Alexa and um, all of the other kind of AI things, and I'm not sure you guys totally answered the question, um, which is, when can I yell in the air and have a trip booked for me? <laughs> and when are, when, when are those things going to happen? And, and to Adam's point or somebody's point, around this split between corporate and personal, we've tried to do this on mobile and have basically failed. So why do you guys think we can do this with AI or do you think we just have to be blended and, and manage it that way? Well, I, th I think there's a couple pieces to that whole thing, too, and we, I, I think you're right. I don't think we ever, ever answered it. There's, there's two pieces to, as to when it's going to come. I think it's, it's coming. It'll be here tomorrow. Um, you hope it's here tomorrow. I hope it's here tomorrow. Well, it, it, my take on that is a little bit different. It's more of there's a point at which there's convenience, and then there's a point at which things are creepy. <laughs> and where's the line between convenient and creepy? So for yeah. those of you that don't know, Ken right now is um, channeling Ben Robbins, who's done a uh, yeah. creepy versus uh, yeah. and, and cool and presentation. And, it, and, it's, and, it's, and it's really, that's, it's, it's, to, you know, it's to that extent. You know, talk about Google scheduling my time for me. You know, what happens when I wake up in the morning? You know, nothing happens if it doesn't show up on my phone. I, I, today, <laughs> yeah, if it's not on my phone, it doesn't happen. My wife has gotten to the point where she sends me calendar invites for things she knows I need to be on. But, you know, it's, it, your, your but again, you know, so does Google, <laughs> is Google going to get to that? You know, is it going to get to that point when it's, okay, it's time to wake up, it's time to brush your teeth, you have 14 minutes to use the bathroom, you blah, 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 blah. Or is it going to get to that point? I hope not, but... Title of next blog, my AI is stalking me, what yeah. to do next? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, what's worse is I love the fact that Google reads my mail and sees an itinerary that a trip's coming up. But when that trip gets canceled, it doesn't remove it. Right. And so three weeks ago, I had a trip scheduled to California. It got moved by a week. All of a sudden, I get a warning that comes up. You're supposed to be on your way to Newark, right, to cool. the airport. I'm going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This trip is, and I'm looking at my calendar, and the appointment's there. And I'm trying to figure out, because you lose track of time in some of the stuff yeah, we do. We get so busy. It's like, yeah. am I supposed to be on a plane in two hours? I don't have anything booked. I don't know where I'm staying. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's scheduled, it just didn't cancel it. And that email came through. Yep. 
Anybody else want to pipe up? Because I know we're out of time. Guys, can I get a huge no, round of applause good. for these guys? I think they did a great job. Yeah.